So, good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon session on quantum computation. My name is Xie Chen. I'm from the physics department of Caltech. And today we have two distinguished speakers for this session, Pro Professor Christopher Monroe and Pro Professor Jason Alicia. So let me introduce um, um, Professor Chris Monroe first. Uh, Chris Monroe is a leading expert in trap ion quantum computation. Uh, he is a distinguished university professor and the B.J. Sechi Zorn professor at the University of Maryland, where his research group develops all the cutting edge technology to trap atomic ions and use individual photons to control their quantum states and then use the platform to realize quantum simulation and quantum computation. He's also the co-founder and chief scientist at IonQ, which is a startup company for developing world-leading general purpose quantum information processors. Among the many awards Chris has received over the years for his contribution is the APS Rabi Award for Atomic and Molecular and Optical Physics, International Quantum Communication Award, and Arthur Shawlow Prize in Laser Science. He was also elected to the National Academy of Science in 1916. So he'll be telling us today about quantum computing, Feynman's opportunity. Please. Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, warm introduction. And um, I'm certainly honored to be here at this incredible event. And I also feel a little like I maybe don't make the cut. I'm <laughs> certainly, I, I, I didn't know Richard Feynman personally, but I, I want to share one very brief, uh, very personal story that uh, when I was in uh, second year in graduate school, I was leaving. I was done. Uh, I decided I was going to be an engineer. It's an honorable thing. I was going. I in fact interviewed for jobs. I had some lined up, and that was the fall of 88, 1988. And he, he had died then, and I read uh, a description of his work and his, uh, his biography and so forth. I think it was in Physics Today. And you know, it just, it's a very personal thing, but it just brought a great deal of excitement into me. And I was thinking, you know, I can always do engineering later. <laughs> I, I need to learn more of physics. So, so I, did, um, I did take the summer off and uh, uh, backpacked in Europe with my college buddies, but I came right back. Uh, in the grad school, and, and I, I do remember that week uh, making that decision. And so I, I actually personally owe a lot to, to his legacy and his uh, ability to tinker with things and think about problems in so many different fields. And so I'm going to start, there's going to be a few talks today on the topic of quantum information science. And uh, Feynman had an outsized influence in this field, which is just now uh, hitting pay dirt in many ways. So the title here is Feynman's Opportunity, and I will uh, expound on that in a little while. Uh, but w one thing um, about computing and the science of information is that um, information is always based in some type of physical process. What are, if it's a storage medium, if it's a processor, there's always some physics behind it. There has to be something physical about that. Um, and w when we look in history at the first computer by, by many accounts, this mechanical difference engine of Charles Babbage. Um, back then, there was no unifying theory of computation. This was thought of maybe as a one-off machine that could do a certain task. Uh, but you know, at that time, there were electrical relays. The, the same idea behind this computer could have been manifest in many different hardwares. Uh, it, but it wasn't until the 20th century that we, uh, we, we were blessed with a very general theory of computation. And, these two men, Alan Turing and Claude Shannon, are really behind it. Uh, Turing uh, invented the idea of an abstract computer, a machine that would, that would uh, process information in a serial way, maybe with a tape and a head that could, pr pr for instance, have memory and move bits around. And any type of classical computer can be modeled to this abstract thing. And the important thing is uh, he didn't care what the hardware was. He didn't really care what the, this machine looked like. Claude Shannon, for his part, really defined the field of information theory in terms of the most basic form of information, the bit. Zero or one carries information. When you send lots of bits, you can encode, of course. Our alphabet has 26 characters. And he even, um, he even uh, quantified the amount of information contained in an alphabet with different probabilities with this funny P log P form. 
I'll return to that in a little while. So with 26 letters, each letter carries roughly you know, four or five bits of information. And that's, that, that comes from, from this formula right here. So with, with, um, with this advent in generalized theories of computing and information, uh, it was no coincidence that the mid 20th century is when we saw the information era develop in terms of hardware. And this is one example in the US, the first digital computer based on vacuum tubes, ENIAC. It had several thousand vacuum tubes. It wasn't very reliable. These vacuum tubes would break, and there were full-time engineers just to replace these vacuum tubes. Um, but shortly after that, we had this beautiful picture. All physicists know this. The first transistor developed at Bell Labs in 1947. And this looks like hardly an improvement over vacuum tubes, actually. In fact, it wasn't, because this, these things were entirely unreliable. Uh, this is a chunk of germanium, and there's a little bit of a gold foil on the bottom of this triangular piece of glass. And there's some amount of tension you have to have to push into it. The humidity has to be just right. There, has to be, there should be a little layer of water on there. Um, I, I read a story that one of these folks at, uh, at Bell Labs, one of the transistors stopped working. And so they dunked it in water and left it submerged and it started working again. So these, these things were uh, highly unreliable. And I bring this up because um, it, it's hard to realize that this is actually a lot better than vacuum tubes, especially at the time. But it is a lot better because it's based on solid state effects. You don't need a vacuum. So you can think about miniaturizing, making things small. And I believe, again, I don't know exactly the history of this. I believe Feynman was very much interested in miniaturization in general, the fundamental limits to doing things. For instance, computing. And so my title is derived basically from, um, from the idea of Moore's law coming to an end. And this is a little bit, little bit overhyped. You've heard this before. But uh, this is Moore's law, the, the number of transistors on computer chips over time over the last few decades. You've heard it expressed as the number of uh, transistors doubles every, every couple of years or something. And that's this exponential growth. Um, and the problem with Moore's law, I mean, to go from this to a, a billions of transistors on a chip is unbelievable, really. And in those many decades of intervening period, um, people learned how to, I, 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 I should be careful not to talk to engineers this way, but people didn't learn any new physics about the devices, but they learned how to make them reliable. You needed clean rooms, it could be no dust, everything had to be super clean, and, and, uh, but the laws of physics don't change when you make things smaller. Well, when you keep making things smaller, there's a problem because eventually these transistors are going to get so small that they're going to approach individual atoms, individual atomic scale dimensions. And that is a problem. Well, it's a, maybe it's not necessarily a problem, but you aren't going to be able to continue this growth unless you split the atom inside of a, inside of a computer, and we probably don't want to do that. Um, so this is what I call Feynman's opportunity. And you all know this very famous lecture. I think it's on the Caltech archives from the 1959 meeting of the American Physical Society, his uh, very famous uh, lecture, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And what he means is that, yes, you can shrink things down, really down, super tiny, and get the same physics out. But he, he has l lots of tantalizing lines in this, in this lecture. And the one I like most is this right here, I highlighted in red. When you make circuits of individual atoms, it offers completely new opportunities for design. Now, he didn't identify those opportunities, by the way. In fact, it took another 40 years, I would say, before those opportunities were made clear. Well, the opportunities exist because the entire theory of doing computing at that level is different than doing it at a macroscopic level. It's the theory of quantum physics. Things are radically different there. So you might say Feynman's opportunity is to somehow enjoy this exponential growth by changing the rules of the game, changing the laws of physics underneath it. OK. Uh, and I'll, I'll return to that and where we are on building quantum computers that e actually exploit the quantum rules at the very small levels. And um, as a rule of thumb, uh, set your sights low. Things are, uh, uh, things are in such an early stage, it's not even clear that quantum computers will be able to do anything very interesting anytime soon, if ever. Probably ever, but uh, not anytime soon. Um, OK. so. Uh, my, my, my first interaction with Feynman's work profession was actually in his, um, in his lectures on computation, of all things, outside of the, the famous Caltech uh, uh, physics courses. We all, we all, all physics students go through those. Um, 
But when, when you consider what, what information is and how gates work and how you process information according to a Turing machine, for instance, you really need to dig into the hardware. And so this is an example of pretty much the standard for processing classical information. You simply wire together a couple of transistors and you can make gates. These are so-called logic operations. This one is called the NAND gate. So if you take two logical states, zero, one, two bits, you can form the NAND of them. That is um, A and B and negate the whole thing. So here's the truth table. So if you have the four possible inputs of these two bits, that's the output. That's called the NAND. And a transistor, is, is, as you know, is, is simply a valve. And when, a, when, when, when the input to a transistor is high, it allows current to flow. So only when both of these are high can current flow and this output be zero. Uh, if either one is low, then the out, there is no current, and the output just latches to the, to the voltage V. Okay? So the NAND gate. Well, so what's significant about the physics here? Well, this is a little bit of a, a detour on my main, uh, my main uh, topic, but, but it's going to connect, as you'll see. Now, the reason I bring this up is that when you look at this resistor here, we're flowing current through the resistor. That's dissipation. It causes heat. It dissipates power. And to run a NAND gate, on average, you have to throw away some, throw some energy into it. Now, th there is some very interesting work coming out of IBM led by Rolf Landauer back in the 60s and 70s. And the idea was, and this, this, is so, this sounds so academic, of the power dissipated in a NAND gate, can we bring that down to zero? Well, we could make the resistor very high. Then the circuit would be slow. They're technical. But they, they're, there came theories on, well, we can make that really low. But Landauer came up with another source of dissipation that's not encapsulated in this at all. And it has to do with Shannon's entropy. Because if you have two inputs and one output, you're throwing away information. It's not reversible. Um, now, that itself is not a problem, as long as you have lots of wires. But when you scale a system up, that's way too many wires. And you're, you're throwing away information. Where does the information go? You have to reset things. And it turns out when you reset bits, that's a form of cooling. It takes power to do that. So there's a fundamental dissipation in the operation of a gate like this. In fact, at the time, I believe in the early 70s, um, the amount of fundamental power dissipation compared to this power dissipating was, I think, 10 to the minus 24. So it was really an academic source. Who cares? All right, we, we just saved a part in 10 to the 24 of the energy bill on your IBM computer. I'm sure nobody cared about that. But this, this work was far-reaching. And um, now it takes me to th these lectures on computation. And I was astounded. At, there's a chapter in this book about the thermodynamics of computation. And Feynman, in a, such a clear way, linked Shannon's entropy with thermodynamic entropy, which we all learn, we all learn usually from an engineering standpoint, with lots and lots of particles. And his connection had to do with a single molecule ideal gas, if that makes any sense. And the idea was to store a bit in this, the location of this molecule. Is it on the right or the left? That's a zero or a one. And if the whole thing is at temperature T, he made the, he, just a beautiful, beautifully simple calculation here. You know, this, this particle is moving around at temperature T, so it pushes on the walls. It has pressure. It has all the thermodynamic quantities. But it's only one molecule, so it's a little weird to think about it in that way. But to reset this bit, you can do it simply by slowly pushing a piston uh, uh, from right to left or left to right. And if everything's done at a constant temperature, that's an isothermal compression, we know very simply that the amount of work required to do this, since this molecule is pushing on the piston, is kT log 2. Um, and the amount of entropy that you, that you transfer, you lose in this process, is k log 2. This is exactly Shannon's entropy of information. In other words, this bit, this situation has no entropy. This one does. It has information. Where is the molecule? Here we know the molecules in the state zero. Okay? So that connection, I mean, it, it's as simple as it sounds. And I think it's still kind of controversial to think about an ideal gas in terms of one molecule. But it was a very interesting connection. Uh, and so, so that was a little bit roundabout. But um, this takes me to uh, a very famous meeting in the early 80s, 1981, outside of MIT. Uh, uh, this conference is on the physics of computation. In fact, uh, Landauer is right here, this guy. And Feynman's in the back. I highlighted him with the arrow. 
Well, so we had this 10 to the minus 24 problem, and maybe in the future that 10 to the minus 24 will get, get bigger. And in fact, today, that 10 to the minus 24, the fundamental fraction of, of dissipated energy, I think it's about 10 to the minus 3 right now in, in modern uh, computers. It's still kind of small. You don't worry about it, but you know, it's getting important. Maybe it'll become 10 to the minus 1. Maybe it becomes very important. And what Landauer was after, and a few others in this audience, they were after a theory of reversible computation. Can we make gates, not the NAND gate, but can we somehow wire things so that we can keep the inputs? Now, that turns out to be really hard, and it's very subtle why it's hard. But in effect, these bits have to behave like analog computers, and they're very sensitive to noise. There were, uh, Charlie Bennett is in this audience too, and, and so is Paul Benioff, and they were thinking of so-called billiard ball models that were reversible gates, but they were really sensitive to noise. Um, and this is, again, I wasn't at this meeting, I was in high school, uh, but uh, I had heard accounts of this meeting that um, they were thinking, well, why is it so hard to get reversible computing? Well, it's because the laws of physics, the laws of Newtonian physics, uh, aren't so easily reversible. They're very sensitive to noise. And Feynman apparently stood up and said, well, I know a theory that's perfectly reversible. It's called quantum mechanics. As we know, quantum propagation is reversible in time. It's also very sensitive to noise. That's another story. But the theory of quantum mechanics, if you have an isolated system, it should be reversible. And so at that meeting, I would say, Maybe this is putting it loosely. At that meeting, the idea of quantum computing, quantum gates, it was born. Largely stimulated by Feynman. Paul Benioff is in the crowd somewhere, and he started scribbling down ways to do quantum logic gates and forming families of gates like the NAND that you could do with quantum. OK, so what is this quantum computing? The idea is that instead of storing bits in 0 or 1 in definite states, store bits in a quantum system that allows the existence of superpositions of 0 and 1. Any weighting you want, 90, 10, 50, 50, 60, 40, you can store superpositions of information. Um, and that, as I'll show you in a minute in, in, in very loose language, it allows another Moore's law to take over. Because if you, have, if you have lots and lots of bits, there's an exponential growth sort of inherent in that system. So I'm going to now tell you the story behind what a quantum computer is. Uh, without being very specific, because it's very hard to be specific. Uh, but it's a good news, bad news, good news story. And it has to do with how quantum superpositions build up. And there's a little bad news in there, how you actually can deal with the superposition. But then there's a final piece of good news. So the first piece of very good news is this, this exponential growth I hinted at. If you put n bits together, there are 2 to the n uh, possible amplitudes, we call them, probabilities that you can store. So this is an example for just three bits. There are eight states. And each of these eight numbers is continuous. They're weightings. How much zero is there? How much six is there in this superposition? Those are continuous parameters. Now, three is pretty small. I've, I've tried to indicate with this block diagram of, say, a parallel computer where we don't have parallel processors. We have all these inputs at the same time in one quantum processor. And through the magic of exponentials, of course, this system doesn't have to be very big to be incalculable classically. So with 300 qubits, for instance, 2 to the 300 is about 10 to the 90. So you can't do any classical computation with 10 to the 90 inputs ever. We don't think the universe is that big, although based on this morning's lectures, maybe, 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 maybe we have to go to 400 qubits. But uh, in any case, 2 to the several hundred is huge. <laughs> And this is really the piece of good news. It would seem like we can have, we can just go right on Moore's law again, keep building things up. Well, of course, if you know anything about quantum mechanics, you know that it's ridiculous to imagine something in two states at the same time. We don't experience that in everyday life. So we, we sort of, in an ad hoc way, I don't mean to indict quantum mechanics this way, but in an ad hoc way, we say, well, quantum measurement uh, collapses the quantum superposition to one value and one value only. This is sort of a necessary addition to quantum mechanics to reconcile with, with uh, everything we see in the lab. You don't see, you don't see things in two places, right? Um, now, there may be, there was discussion this morning about multiverse theories and so forth, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also uncomfortable there. So let's just say quantum measurement pops quantum superpositions into one state or the other. Well, this is disastrous if you have exponentially many of them. If you have 10 to the 90 inputs and they result into 10 to the 90 outputs. When it comes time to measure, you only get one. 
And quantum mechanics tells us this one is totally random. It depends on all the weightings. So in fact, you, you have, there's almost, there's really zero information here. You have no idea what input produced that output. So it would seem that one-to-one -one functions are not very interesting for quantum computing, and that's actually true. But there is final piece of good news, and that is before you measure, you do something very clever. You allow these amplitudes to interfere. I didn't say that, um, that these amplitudes, these probabilities, they follow a wave equation. It's, a, it's, it's just a standard wave equation. There's really nothing new there. We're very familiar with wave equations in all kinds of contexts mechanical waves, light waves. These are quantum waves, existence waves. And so there's a lot of math behind how, how these A's evolve in time. And I've tried to depict that in this silly picture here of these blue lines being the evolution of the, of the weights. And at the end of the day, um, maybe they all interfere destructively and you end up with just one answer at the end, or a few, but not two to the 300. If you have two to the 300 answers, you're dead. Maybe 300 or 3,000, it's a small number, and you can repeat the experiment many times to get that distribution. Now, if this evolution, these red dots, by the way, are quantum gates, they allow us to sort of point the uh, amplitudes to a particular answer, and this is really the art in quantum computing, how to design these gates to do something interesting. But if you do that, and you have this very sparse output, that, the output that you measure can depend on all those inputs, and that's where the gold is. That's where quantum computing has a potential, uh, a potential workspace. Now, there, there's, uh, I, would, I, I wanted to acknowledge David Deutsch, and he was one who really, in the early 90s, and late 80s, put together this final piece of good news, the idea that there, there exist problems that can be done in ways that you can't do classically. Okay. Um, now, hi hidden in all of this, in fact, even this quantum state, um, is the concept of entanglement. And this is actually, to me, it's nothing more scary than the superposition itself. Uh, if, you, if you think of a superposition of one bit, zero and one, um, the way we think about how to, one way to think about measurement is that, well, if I'm in the room looking at that zero or one, I can think of myself becoming entangled, and my consciousness sees a one and the state of one, superposed with my consciousness seeing a zero and the bits in state zero. That's called entanglement. Uh, it, it means that you have a complex superposition of many bits that's in its basic form. And of course, entanglement it has a storied past as well, uh, as pretty much, uh, I would say, this was Einstein's counterexample to quantum mechanics. He didn't quite accept quantum mechanics. M not many really did. He didn't accept it as being a complete theory of nature. This idea of entanglement, when you measure something over here, something happens over there, seemed too much. Um, but entanglement is here to stay, and it was extended, John Bell extended these ideas of entanglement to show that if there is a more complete theory, it's at least as weird as what we have. So we might as well just stick with what we have. That's sort of my feeling. <laughs> um, so after David Deutsch, uh, along came in the mid-90s uh, a, a, a very famous algorithm that we all know now as Shor's factoring algorithm. So, uh, David Deutsch said impos it, it's, it's it, it, impossible, it's principle, uh, in, in principle, it's possible to uh, build a quantum computer that can do something interesting. And Shor actually um, converted the factoring problem into finding the period of a, of a, of a non-trivial function. And the period of a function is exactly one of these types of global observables. If I have lots of inputs, the period is a function of all those inputs. And Peter Shore put that together into his factoring algorithm, and he showed that if a quantum computer were built, it could factor numbers exponentially faster than any known classical uh, algorithm. That was a big deal, of course. There are other algorithms, other algorithms but none as important as that. Um, and so this field, since the mid-'90s, has really grown. And over the last uh, decade and a half or so, this is copied uh, from, uh, from Google Scholar here, the number of papers that mention these three terms per year. Um, you'll, uh, yeah, so, so you'll know, it's, I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's grown at an amazing pace in the last several years. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that hardware is starting to be developed that can do not quite yet interesting things, but we're getting hardware that is becoming more and more reliable. And so of the hardwares, actually, I should say, I'm, an ex I'm one of the few experimentalists at this uh, symposium, so I will talk about a few of these, few of these types of hardware and the challenges ahead. Um, these hardwares are all pretty exotic. 
Well, that stands to reason because to do a quantum computation, you have to have almost perfect isolation of the quantum system. And then at the end of the day, you have to have almost perfect measurement of the quantum system. You need to turn on and off isolation is perfect, in almost a perfect way. And that's very difficult to do in many systems. Uh, superconducting loops of wire carry, can carry information losslessly. So they're very isolated. And then you can measure them inductively, capacitively. I'm going to talk a little more about trapped ions, individual atoms, as Feynman originally suggested. And, and because each atom is the same, you can think about scaling them up without worrying about defects in a certain way. And there are other, uh, other uh, candidates out there as well. We're gonna, Jason's going to tell us a little bit about a very interesting possibility of realizing what he calls uh, 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 there's plenty of room in the middle, the, the idea of getting emergent type quantum bits in, in condensed matter. A very active research field, and, and uh, look, for, look forward to that as well. So individual atoms, sort of the natural place to start, if you're like me, at the very, very bottom. Uh, and, and here we store our qubit in two states of a single atom. Um, and it has lots of, uh, uh, lo lots of uh, advantages to doing this. These atoms, these states, are basically behind what we have in atomic clocks. So they're very coherent. Um, now, the atoms are, not usually, atoms are not usually isolated. They're usually part of a surface or inside of a solid. These atoms are floating in space in a vacuum chamber, so there's no air. They're, in fact, atomic ions. And uh, I'm going to show you how, how we make gates and entangle individual atomic ions. So this is a picture of a crystal of a few atoms. And they're separated by many microns. We can, see optically, um, uh, we can optically resolve these atoms very easily. Um, now, these atoms, they're charged, so they repel each other. So there's invisible springs connecting them. And the way we entangle, the way we make quantum gates, it looks simple in its cartoon, but we simply shine lasers at a certain way on particular pairs of atoms. And uh, th these, these, these light beams exert a force on the atom. It's a very visual type picture what's going on. But the thing is, the direction of the force can be dependent on the state of the qubit. So if the, if the qubit is the state one, it moves up. If it's state zero, it moves down. So this atom, I'm trying to draw it in two places at the same time. If we do that to two at the same time, then their Coulomb interaction uh, basically allows us to do a gate between these two qubits. And that's how we entangle them. So imagine a bunch of lasers hitting atoms in sequence to do a quantum computation. That's really uh, how this works. And this was promoted a long time ago uh, by Sirac and Zoller. And I worked with Dave Weinland in the 1990s at NIST to develop some of the basic schemes here. And here's actually a recent schematic of an experiment. Again, lower your sights. This one has only five qubits. But we have full control over these five qubits with laser beams that can hit any pair, or any individual, or all five at the same time. And I want to, um, again, this is going to be a little fast. This is uh, uh, an example of a very simple algorithm using a five qubit. We only use four qubits in this case of, of, the, of the quantum computer. It's called the hidden shift algorithm. It's, um, it's a little bit useless, I would say. It's one of these so-called oracle algorithms. The idea is if I give you two functions and the inputs are shifted by an unknown amount, what is that shift? Well, you have to evaluate every input to see what that shift is, or half of the inputs anyway. So it's exponential with the number of bits in S. Well, quantum mechanically, if you can, if you can program these functions quantum mechanically, you only have to evaluate it once. So it's exponential speed up of sort of a contrived problem, if you want. And very, very briefly, this, you know, for four qubits, there are, four, there are 16 possible four qubit numbers, four bit numbers. And uh, the results of detecting those, those hidden shifts is here. And all I want to say is that this should have been 100% on the diagonal. And it was only 80% because our gates are not perfect. This is the circuit. That's space. That's time. And we go through and apply laser beams to these things. Um, and each gate is imperfect, but they're about 99% pure. You know, this is sort of just starting here. Um, and it worked OK, about 80%. Well, we ran the same thing on another quantum computer, this one hosted by IBM, which also had five qubits, coincidentally, based on superconductors. Now, the only difference was they could only do restricted sets of gates with qubits that were tied to each other at nearest neighbor. And because of that, this circuit had a lot, a lot harder of a time being operated in the IBM system. So, so this is a very high level statement. But in quantum computing, you want to design your, your physical system around the algorithm. 
It's sort of called co-design in, in computer science. Um, and that's one of the lessons we're learning. So um, actually, in the last couple of years, on this five qubit machine, we've recently gone up to seven, there's just a slurry of, of simulations and applications. And people have basically called us up. And you know, we'd love to run this algorithm on your little five qubit system. Of course, with five qubits, we know exactly what's going on. Um, but I wanted to uh, just highlight one of these um, so-called scrambling tests because it gives me the opportunity to show you a black hole. And speaking to this audience, it's, it's kind of scary to say that, but everybody knows this is, this is what a black hole looks like. What does a black hole have to do with a seven qubit circuit? Well, there's something uh, purported that goes on in a black hole called scrambling. If you were to put a quantum bit in a black hole, it would immediately sort of uh, interact with all the other constituents of that black hole. That's called quantum scrambling. It's more than entanglement. It, 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 it covers the entirety of the black hole. And because a black hole is considered to be isolated, we should be able to model it as a, a quantum unitary process. And so what we've done in this, this seven qubit circuit is our black holes are modeled as just three qubit operators. It's a very small black hole. And the idea is, if this operator, we can test whether this operator scrambles or not. And that's actually a non-trivial thing to do at first glance. And what happens is uh, this input state gets mapped over to that state if and only if u is uh, scrambling. By the way, we have to model the black hole and its inverse with circuits. And we know how to do that for very small systems. And we've been helped, actually, at my, at my campus. Brian Swingle, a new faculty member there, has helped us on that. So I want to step back now and, and move away from quantum computing into what we believe is going to be the, the, um, the application space of quantum computers over the next maybe even more than a decade. And that is something called quantum simulation. And so this is another area where, where, where Feynman uh, really had an outsized influence. He, um, maybe more than, more than anybody, understood that quantum problems are hard because there's an exponential scaling in solving the wave equation for all these qubits. And if you want to model a physical system that's quantum, it just becomes hard very fast. And so he promoted the idea of having a quantum simulator um, that would be sort of an emulator that would uh, take a standard quantum system, a quantum computer, that models the interactions in the real system. And by measuring the fake system that you've contrived in just the right way, you might be able to learn something about the real system, quantum simulation. And you know, there, there are lots of examples of that. Very recently, a couple of examples involving lots of qubits, up to 50 or so. Um, here, here's a string of 53 individual atoms. Now, these, these qubits are sort of like bar magnets. One is north up, zero is uh, north down. And they can be made to interact with these laser beams, very much like bar magnets interact. Now, if you put 53 bar magnets together, their interactions can be very complicated, and in fact, these interactions are very long range, so they all sort of compete with each other. Um, and we're, we're able to observe something very interesting that we couldn't calculate, and that is a competition between the spins wanting to, these, uh, these magnets wanting to order, uh, competed, uh, big in competition with them wanting to align according to an external field. Um, so this is, there are lots of known phase transitions in quantum magnetism, and this is one of them. This is a so-called dynamical phase transition. We could not calculate where that, where that little spike was in the size of the domain. And what's, what's really cool about this is that there was another experiment pretty much simultaneously running out of Harvard that had roughly 50 atoms as well. These are neutral atoms that have nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor interactions, and they observed very similar type magnetic ordering phenomena. And I, I put this up here also because Manuel Andres is a big part of this group, and he's now, of course, uh, starting his group here at Caltech on a very similar system. So what would have Feynman thought of this field right now? I think he would have been, he, he would have been amazed at the ability to control very simple systems at the very bottom. He may also have been amazed at just the amount of attention this field is being uh, afforded uh, throughout the world. This is a couple of years ago from uh, an article in The Economist. That's why everything's in euros. Um, but the amount of annual funding in 2015 for the, all the countries. So why are they doing this? I, I think um, the world believes that quantum computers might be able to do things that are not just factoring numbers for code breaking, but these quantum simulations, maybe for chemistry, to understand 
uh, drug efficacy uh, to, to, to do uh, problems even in magnetism. I, sh I, I showed connections to real problems in magnetism. Now, the traveling salesman problem is something I like to quote because we don't think a quantum computer will, will be able to do the traveling salesman problem. Pick the, le the, the shortest path between a bunch of cities. Um, but it's, it's this type of a problem that a quantum computer might be able to approximate and be used as a heuristic that could perform better than any classical computer. We have to build it and test it. But logistical problems like the traveling salesman uh, are huge. And this is, I think this is underlies why there's such a widespread interest in this field and also in, uh, in industry. Uh, the behemoth industries, especially in the US, Google, Microsoft, Intel, um, IBM, and so forth, are getting engaged in this field in a very big way. There's a lot of startups, and again, full disclosure, that's, uh, we, we, we're trying to put our iron trap on the cloud so people can use it, and that's what IonQ is doing. But I think Feynman would have, uh, I, I was pleased to hear this morning that he had a very, uh, a very good bullshit meter. There's a lot of bullshit in this field. Oh my god. <laughs> There's so much noise. Um, I won't, I'm being recorded, so I just won't comment. Um, this is an ad advertisement for one of the companies aforementioned, D-Wave. Um, my last slide is, I, I stole it from MIT Tech Review. It had to do with blockchain, but I think this is quantum computing here. Um, uh, look, it, it, there is a lot of hype in the field, but uh, uh, some of it is well-placed. I think, uh, and I think Feynman, his, he, he would have been, I think, really attracted to this field. I didn't talk at all about error correction, by the way. How do you make quantum computer systems latch? That's a, a, a growing subject. It's fascinating on its own right. Um, and I think Feynman probably would have been engrossed in how information theory has, now has a new cousin called quantum information theory, where all the rules are different. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Well, I guess I can throw something out to get. Well, sorry. So Chris, that was a great talk. But you said something very pessimistic early on. You said you weren't even sure if quantum computers would ever actually become useful. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Why is your, you, you've been working in this field long, longer than anyone experimentally. So why do you think that's the case? And I'll um, give you a chance to retract that quote if no, you want. No, no. Um, <laughs> I, hope, I hope my startup investors aren't watching this. <laughs> and actually, I, shouldn't have, I just shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I, I, th I think to prove that a quantum computer can do something better than any classical means, that's going to be very tricky. I, I do think there is room for quantum computers to be better than classical computers at some useful problem. But um, it's very hard to, I don't know, I, I think if you want to take a hard core point of view, it's very hard to prove that especially in the, in the uh, uh, area of quantum simulations. So the word heuristic is one of these BS words. I, I, you know, we all use it. Heuristics, you know, uh, there's, it's sort of ad hoc proof. And it's not, not, not even proof. It's ad hoc existence of something that's useful. And that's probably where quantum computing will live. It will be, I think it will be interesting. And I think it'll have, it'll have uh, an application space. But we're, we're just not, there's so much uncertainty there. Um, now, Shor's algorithm is an interesting case of, it, it, it's very clear that if we have billions of qubits and we can run trillions of operations or maybe billions of operations, we can factor big numbers. Um, but again, it's notoriously hard to prove that classical routines can't factor as well. That doesn't mean it's not useful, though. So you know, may, maybe I was a little, little stern there. But we should, we should very, you know, keep, keep in mind that it's not clear what the application space of quantum will be. And that's what makes it fun. Just, just a little historical information. Um, <clears throat> the meeting that was held at Endicott House, I sort of organized that meeting. Oh, and great. I invited uh, Feynman, whom I, uh, yeah, I'm in that picture there, okay, where? sitting in the front. <laughs> uh, I can apologize for not pointing you out. <laughs> well, sitting down on the I'm sitting 
Right there. Wait, back a little. That's me. Right here. That's me. Right. Okay. Yeah. right. And Feynman's up behind me there. Mm -hmm. I think somewhere. Oh, no, over there. Feynman's the pointed there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Um, so did I get it right? Yeah. No, no, um, the it's thing, the meeting itself. When, when, uh, when the meeting started, uh, you know, I wanted Feynman to come to the meeting because I'd worked with him at, uh, here at Caltech for a year before that. And uh, I invited him to come, and he agreed to come, and so on and so forth. And uh, then I told him I wanted to... Uh, you know, the meeting was supposed to be on uh, possibilities of something like quantum computation or something like that. I don't remember the name I proposed, but uh, uh, when I told Feynman what the name of the meeting was, uh, he said, if that's the name of the meeting, I'm not coming. So I changed the name of the meeting, since it was up to me. <laughs> so he came. So I happened to tell Michael Dertuzos, who, was, who had replaced me as the director of the AI, of the uh, computation lab at MIT. And, uh, and so when he introduced Feynman, he made a reference to the fact that I had told called the meeting one thing and Feynman said he wouldn't come and you know he made a big deal out of it. Then Feynman said, well, since then I've changed my mind and that's what I want to talk about was the, was the original title. <laughs> anyway, that's just a little anecdote. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Professor, I have a general question about uh, uh, quantum computers. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, one important uh, application of a quantum computer is uh, parallelizing computation. Um, in, in classic uh, computers, uh, uh, GPU uh, is the hardware equipment for uh, parallelizing computation. Uh, so uh, what, what is the hardware uh, equipment for, um, for quantum parallelizing computation? Uh, what is the basic idea? I, yeah, I, th I think you're um, maybe a few decades in the future here. I would, I would say, number one, that the difference between any classical computer and any quantum computer is profound. So, so when, I, when I say that a quantum system is, it's only an analogy, a weak one, that a quantum computer is sort of like a parallel classical computer because it scales exponentially. And you can't have an arbitrarily sized a classical uh, parallel computer. There's not enough room in the universe for it. And these are the numbers we're talking about that you get for free in quantum. Now, maybe what you're addressing is, all right, let's say we have a machine with 1,000 qubits. Now we want to parallelize that. We want to somehow operate many of them at the same time and sort of in, the, in a style that GPUs are run now. That's, yeah, that's, that I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we're at such an early stage of this technology now. I think maybe that was your question. <laughs> Since uh, using numbers that are combinations, uh, products of very large primes, are used as the basis for many encryption schemes today, uh, how long do you think it will be, if ever, before quantum computing will allow us to routinely break uh, encryption schemes that are used today? And even to get it to the nearest decade would be interesting. So in 1995, we were asked that same question when I was at NIST, and the NSA in particular, they need to know when. They don't want only to have the machine to break codes or whatever, but they need to know when anybody will have one of these, because it, 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 it impacts how you encrypt things now if you want them to be secret over a long time. Well, that's why I asked the question, I, but I, I didn't want to yeah. use those three letters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hate to say that in, in 1995, my answer would have been 20 or 30 years, and right now I'd say 20 to 30 years. It's, <laughs> sorry to say what that. What would but, it be 20 or 30 years from now? 20, 30 years. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I, think in tw I think it's not unreasonable to assume we'll have m maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of qubits that are controlled sufficiently well we have to do error correction, so there's layers of redundancy. It's a very complicated problem. Um, after all, a big prime number only has a couple of thousand bits in it. 
but you need lots more space just to do the error correction. Um, and and you know it, it's very hard to predict decades in the future, as I <laughs> found out in the last few decades. So, so, Thank you. So it's one, unfortunately, factoring is one of the hardest problems we, that, that, that's out there right now. I have a negative opinion here. Uh, I visited this company, uh, Rigoletto or something. Rigetti. Rigetti, yeah. yes, right. And saw their quantum computer. It was what I would call BS, you know. Uh, and uh, I don't think that a quantum computer uh, will be built that factors large numbers. That's my opinion. Uh, I know the idea's been around for a long time, and it's hard to understand why, but I'm a computer person, and uh, that's my opinion. I can explain it more, but not here. I, I know I'm running out of time, but I, if I could have 30 seconds, I wanted to share a story when I first met Rolf Landauer at IBM. This was around 1995. He, he was sort of a gruff man, and he sat me down in his office at Yorktown, uh, up at IBM in uh, New York, outside of New York. <clears throat> and he, he slammed the door right next to me. And it just slammed, made a loud sound. He said, did you hear that? And I said, yeah, I heard that. And he, he, he opened the door and then shut it very gently, just enough so that it would latch. And it shut. He said, did you see that? And I said, yeah, I saw that. He said, that's why quantum computers will never work. <laughs> they don't latch. In other words, they're like analog computers. These amplitudes, the, the, you know, it's like an analog computer and it's unstable. Now, that was 1995. In 1997, error correction was invented. It was a big deal. And Landauer, to his great credit, totally stepped back and he said, oh, quantum systems do latch, as long as you have enough headroom. And I, th I, you know, I think your attitude is, I, it's hard to disagree with that, because the headroom is not like Shannon's error correction. You only need 1% extra, you know, the parity check. You need 100,000 times the, the headroom to do one qubit very well. You, need, you might need 100,000 qubits. Or our next speaker will tell us about a beautiful physics result that allows you to do it in a different way. But, um, and I would never be sure about what will happen 20 or 30 years from now when it comes to technology. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against it eventually. <laughs> I think that's a good point too. Stop and thank you.